All right, hello wine drinking people. It's time for what I had to drink yesterday. And man, we had a busy week last week in the store, another busy week this week. And uh, you know, I don't get out of the office to get out of my little hole very often here, but there's a couple things that'll get me out of my office during the daytime here. And uh, one of them is great champagnes. And uh, just so happened LVMH was doing a tasting this Monday afternoon and down at the Soho um, property there in South Beach and a, a fabulous lineup of champagnes in this group, of course, Moet Chandon, their top wine, Dom Perignon, their Tete de Cuvée, uh, one of the most popular wines, champagnes in the world, Veuf Clicquot, one of the most popular champagnes in this country. Uh, we have their Le Grand Dame, one of the greatest champagnes made, uh, but not quite as popular as the Yellow Label. Um, and then we have Krug, my favorite champagne, and this is, uh, you know, it's a rare treat to be able to get to try Krug Rosé. I just had this wine just a week ago at dinner, so not many people at the tasting could have bragged about just drinking the Rosé a few days ago. But uh, I love great champagne. I drink champagne. I usually have sparkling wine or champagne in my refrigerator. Once or twice a week, we pop open a bottle just to celebrate being above ground. This, this portfolio, as I mentioned before, has got some of the finest champagnes, but also the most expensive champagnes. That doesn't always correlate. Uh, you know, quality with price, but the Cru Clos de Ambonnet is $2,000 a bottle. You know, today it seems like it's become fashionable to own a champagne label. Look, Mariah Carey just came out with her champagne angel. P. Diddy, or not P. Diddy, I'm sorry, Jay-Z has got that ace of spades, and uh, it would be foolish for you to pay $2,000 for a bottle of angel, or for $1,000 for ace of spades, rosé, or whatever, you know, their most prestigious wine is in the lineup. You could pay... $1,000 for a bottle of 1975 Dom Enotech, one of the greatest champagnes in the world ever. So do not be hustled by some of these celebrity wines. You know, when it comes to fine champagne, there is nothing better than what you get from these guys that make champagne for a living. Think about it, folks. These guys are rock stars. They're not champagne makers. All right, well, uh, let's get to the wines we had to drink. We started out with a portfolio from Moet Chandon, and this was all just the top-level stuff. We didn't have their Imperial that day, although the Imperial is nice. They've actually dried that wine up a little bit from the days when it was called White Star. Uh, and then, you know, it doesn't have a brick designation on it still to this day, but, you know, one of the people that came by to see me said they are going to change that. It will be a brick champagne at some point soon in the near future. But the Grand Vintage 2002, a great vintage for champagne. And all these wines are substantially discounted. If you check the sale prices we have on this offer, I believe they will be good until the end of the month of May. So this wine had this lovely nutty character to it with this ripe pear and peach kind of fruits. Lovely toasty almond marzipan notes uh, through the finish. Nice freshness, but again, Moe's house style tends to have a little more dosage, a little more sugar in it, so a very fruity style here. And then uh, the Grand Vintage Rosé, 2002 also. Lovely smoky nuance to this wine. Some sun-dried cherry, wild strawberry fruit there. Uh, nice intensity on the tongue. Again, a lot of fruit. Good persistence through the finish. That lovely floral nuance you get from the rosés coming in there. Really nice. General, I prefer the rosé champagne, so this one got a little, just a plus rating higher than the 2002 vintage. Okay, next up, Dom Ruinart's, supposedly the oldest champagne house. I love the Dom Ruinart wines, especially the vintage wines from them. The, one of the greatest champagnes that I've had all year is this 1996 Rosé. Just an incredible champagne with loads of concentration, lovely richness. But hey, let's talk about the 98 Brut first. Rich and nuanced bouquet, lemon, citrus, quince, vanilla cream, candy, ginger, spice. Very complex bouquet. Lovely creamy texture on the tongue. This is what you get from Method Champenoise Bubbles, folks. That lovely, fine, creamy, uh, thin stream of bubbles uh, that just is so elegant and just so beautiful. And uh, carries into a long finish with this 98 wine, a great vintage for Chardonnay. So a lot of the vintage roots higher than normal proportion of Chardonnay in the blend. Of course, you have Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. The other two grapes, uh, Pinot Meunier used to a much lesser degree than Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. All right, but most excellent juice this 1998. And like I said, the 96 vintage brew, just a killer bottle of wine. A dazzling array of wild strawberry, quince, red licorice spice, pretty floral notes, uh, very fine and tiny bubbles on the tongue. This little peppery spice showing up on the finish. Uh, this wine is a blend of 85% Chardonnay from the Côte de Blanc in Montan de Rem and 15% Pinot Noir from Verzenay and Verzi and 100% uh, Grand Cru of Force, of course, killer bottle of bubbly, this 1996 Rosé from Dom Ruinarts. All right, next up, Dom Perignon Rosé. That's right, we're partying like a rock star, folks, Dom Perignon. Well, you know, 2000 was not a great vintage for Champagne and a little bit underwhelmed by this 2000 vintage, uh, you know, Rosé from Dom. Usually this wine is, uh, you know, 
really outstanding. One of, you know, I usually like it better than, than the Dom, but in this case, uh, we had the 1996 Enotech from Dom. Enotech uh, means library, and what Dom Perignon does is set aside some of its uh, cuvee to sit on tourage on the leaves for an extra seven years, and then they disgorge it. And uh, this 96, a phenomenal vintage from Champagne, and you can just tell the hazelnut, fresh lemon zest, biscuits, uh, really a complex bouquet of aroma showing up here, and tremendous concentration and depth on the palate here. Uh, this wine just seems to go on and on the finish, really long, really fine, most excellent juice indeed here. The 1975 Enotech also available. Can anyone say 1800 a bottle? All right. Well, we just sold some 75 for like 400, man, if you guys were paying attention to one of our vintage seller offerings. Not the Enotech version, though. 1998 Vintage Krug up next. That's right, folks. Partying like a rock star Monday afternoon. Drinking Krug and Dom Perignon. Well, the Krug, if I just had to pick one champagne to drink the rest of my life, it would be Krug. You know, I, I don't know if... I'll tell you my Krug story someday later, you know. The one judgment that I won, and after, you know, we finished our trial, I, you know, the jury awarded me $3 million. I went out and drank vintage Krug all night long. And the next morning, I woke up with a slight hangover and about $1,800 worth of charges on my credit card. And we still haven't collected one dime from that settlement. So 1998 vintage Krug, uh, really nice offering here. And, uh, you know, uh, this wine is aged in barrique, so it has this lovely full body character to it, this lovely biscuity kind of flavor, and, uh, you know, a, a intense fruit, concentrated and rich on the palate, and lovely length. Um, you know, the Clos d'Ambonnet, hey, money is no object. We didn't taste it that day, but $22.50 a bottle. If anyone would like to try the 96 vintage, it is available. All right, next up, the multi vintage rose. Krug, uh, is a little play on words here, everyone else uses non vintage. Well, the Krug family will tell you we do not want to put a negative in terms of, you know, our wine anywhere on the bottle. So multi-vintage, same thing basically. You know, it's a blend of several different vintages. Krug does this better than anybody else in terms of the number of vintages and reserve wines. And a vintage like 2003, which is a difficult year, 80% of their stash that they just completely did not use. They threw it away or sold it off in bulk. They only used 20% of their juice for the blends. They didn't make any vintage wine in 2003. But this rosé had a lovely mint kind of strawberry, tobacco, pretty floral notes uh, on the bouquet, very complex. Lovely strawberry Jolly Rancher candy on the on the palate with that mint again and spice showing on the finish. Lovely creamy texture, very fine, very long, most excellent juice, Krug Rosé. All right, next up we had the vintage Veuve Clicquot. As I mentioned before, this 2002 vintage, outstanding, the Veuve Clicquot, uh, very good apple, pear, tangerine kind of fruit Fruit, a touch of ginger spice and brioche, lovely creamy mousse on the tongue with excellent underlying acidity, a long finish, lots of that candied lemon fruit to the end, most excellent juice, as were most of these 2002s. The 2004 Rosé, uh, you know, 2004, not quite as good of a vintage. You really notice the difference when you're tasting these wines back to back. Uh, 2004 had some lovely light strawberry raspberry fruit, some pretty floral nuance, a smooth creamy texture, hints of about a metallic note on the finish with this wine. But uh, again, just a little shorter, not quite as concentrated, as rich as the 2002s. Next up, the 1998 Le Grand Dame. This wine had a lovely vanilla, creme, caramel, kind of brioche toast, almond notes, candied pear and apple fruit, a hint of candy ginger on the nose, really complex and nuanced, a nice, nice yeasty, toasty note there, and lovely persistence. 98, as I mentioned before, a great vintage for Chardonnay. I'm sure this has more Chardonnay in the blend than usual. Most excellent juice. All right, next up, we've got the whole line of still wines from LVMH to go through still. Whew. 